So much of what Donald Trump wants cannot be accomplished through the law, which is why, as you note, so many of these folks advising him are not lawyers. And so the question is going to be, how far can we push or stretch the law before it's just lawless? Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court and the rule of law. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover these things for Slate. And this week, the Supreme Court made history by announcing that it was for the first time going to adopt a new formal ethics code that is neither enforceable nor actually new. But hey, just big props to them for trying This week also brought us a whole lot of kind of gasp-inducing news about plans being advanced to remake the judiciary, the civil service, the Justice Department, policing, immigration law, in the event that Donald J. Trump achieves the presidency in a year or so. As a constitutional and legal matter, this is all sort of alarming, but it's particularly alarming given that the thing that we were starting to get our heads around to understand and fear and cope with specifically Leonard Leo in the Federalist Society, that may not be the thing that is driving Donald Trump's constitutional Scooby-Doo van anymore. Indeed, if recent reporting is to be believed, Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society, having reached peak influence and power, are no longer conservative or radical or imaginative enough to satisfy Donald J. Trump. So we're going to talk today to FedSoc biographer and thinker and observer Amanda hollis Brusky to try to understand whether the conservative legal movement has just wilted before our eyes and brought us into a moment in which FedSoc's ideas are too, what, vanilla and milk toast to be endured by possibly the next Republican president of the U.S., Now, later on in the show, Slate Plus members are going to get a chance to hear from Jay Willis on this question of Supreme Court ethics codes. Mark Joseph Stern is still out on paternity leave, but he would probably be just about as stoked as Jay or myself could be for a non-binding, unenforceable, every justice for himself wish list that passes for an ethics code. But I don't want to speak for Mark. We will be sure to ask him as soon as he gets back. Slate Plus members not only have access to exclusive segments like our Amicus Plus after parties, they also enjoy all of Slate podcasts ad-free. They never hit a paywall at Slate.com. And most vitally of all, they support the work we do here at the magazine and on this show. For this, we are truly, eternally grateful. If you are not a Slate Plus member, but you'd like to find out more, go to Slate.com slash Amicus Plus. And hey, Slate Plusers, thank you. But first, remember back when we used to laugh about how as soon as Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell and all the crazy low-rent parking lot lawyers were out of the picture, the former president would run aground legally? You know, he would have run through the great brains of FedSoc in his first term, his White House counsel, Don McGahn, second White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, and, you know, yes, his just add water FedSoc judges. And the idea was there was nobody scary left for him to pick up and use. But then the news just hit. We are not laughing about parking lot lawyers anymore because the past few weeks have seen really shocking reporting from The New York Times and Axios about Trump's legal plans for the next term if he gets a next term. And we're looking at mass deportations, sprawling detention camps, Insurrection Act being invoked, weaponizing the DOJ to prosecute his political enemies, civil servants screened for political fidelity using AI to staff up judicial, defense, regulatory, domestic policy jobs that he's going to create by firing every government employee who might ever slow his role. At the same time, the New York Times just reported two weeks ago that Leonard Leo and his brainchild, the Federalist Society, are no longer Trump's legal whisperers. Quote, top Trump allies have come to view their party's legal elites, even leaders with seemingly impeccable conservative credentials, as out of step with their movement. End quote. So, Here's our question. What happens if and when FedSoc becomes the dog that caught the car and then the car just backs right on over it? So joining us to discuss what could happen when you are scared you may someday really miss 
Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society is Amanda Hollis Brusky. She is professor of politics at Pomona College and author of the incredibly prescient Ideas with Consequences, The Federalist Society and the Conservative Counter Revolution, published by Oxford University Press in 2015. She's also co-author of Separate but Faithful, The Christian Rights Radical Struggle to Transform Law and Legal Culture, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. Amanda, I have been counting the minutes to get you on the show, and this is the show in which I just want to say, hold me, (laughs) make me feel better. Welcome to Amicus. Thank you, Dahlia. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. If you want to respond to my intro, just go, because I know I just like dumped a bunch. So a few things to think about from the Federal Society's vantage point, right, is that this is an organization that for so many years flourished by working behind the scenes, um, by really kind of laying the path to power in ways that were not subject to public scrutiny, um, by as you said, whispering um, to White House counsel in the Department of Justice um, for judicial selection by being sort of quietly influential. And we saw this particularly during the George W. Bush administration. And then what happened during the Trump administration, as we all know, is that the Federal Society very much co-branded themselves. With Trump, they made a calculated decision that if we, along with Donald Trump, publish this list of potential Supreme Court justices to fill Scalia's vacancy, then we can win over these never Trumpers and these more mainstream Republican voters. And then we get the presidency and then we get the court and we can build out from there. And so as we've seen, you know, this is Leonard Leo very much saying, ooh, we've discovered this fire in Donald J. Trump, and I know it might be dangerous to play with that fire, but I feel like we can control it. And Leo, you know, if we think of Leo in the context of everybody else that Trump appointed in his administration, he really was the outlier, right? He was the mainstream, reliable Republican elite. Donald Trump promised to appoint justices in the mold of Justice Scalia, Leonard Leo made sure he uh, made good on that promise, whereas he broke every other campaign promise, right? So (laughs) Leonard Leo really was the only mainstream element of the conservative movement that managed to stick by Trump and to, to some extent, um, control Donald J. Trump when it came to the courts and it came to the justices. And now they have this fire and they've played with that fire and they've used that fire to burn down abortion rights and to burn down the regulatory state and to burn down areas of immigration and the Muslim ban. And and now they've figured out that they can't really control this fire. And I think that's where we're at. And that's the interesting question here is, you know, how will federal society respond um, knowing that the intent is to burn it all down, right? The the very courts and the institutions and the justices that the Federal Society spent four decades grooming and planting and conditioning and putting in place, Trump wants to burn all of that down. And that is a real threat to Leonard Leo and the Federal Society. So I wonder if you could just start us at the very beginning, because, of course, that's what your book kind of lays out. Leonard Leo, the debate society, the sort of benign, you know, this was just a group of law students who were sort of frustrated that conservative legal ideas weren't getting surfaced and debated on campus. Can you can you kind of bring us back to the 80s and and how this teensy little rebellious to be sure Scalia led kind of way of thinking about the world turns into judicial kingmaker in 2016? Yeah. So as you noted, Dahlia, the Federal Society does form as a small student group at Yale Law School and the University of Chicago Law School. And its founders, folks like Stephen Calabrese, Lee Lieberman Otis, Dave McIntosh, they had, you know, been very deeply involved in Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign, right? They were excited and animated by the ideas that were achieving political ascendancy in the United States, ideas about limited government and free markets and deregulation and social and moral conservatism. And when they got to their elite law schools, as conservatives excited about Reagan and excited about 
these ideas, they recognized that those ideas were not mainstream. They weren't represented well in their, by and large, like liberal law schools. And so the idea was to bring some of these conservative ideas about the law specifically into the conversation by inviting conservative law professors and luminaries who were scattered all over the country together for a conference at Yale in 1982. And so it does have this really kind of humble origin story. But when you talk to the founders, they were very conscious that what they needed to do was not just have a student group and bring ideas into their law schools. They needed to build a conservative counter elite. And that idea was on the minds of the founders from the beginning. These were very sophisticated intellectuals who understood that, first of all, ideas have consequences, right? This was this book by Richard Weaver that the mantra of the early 1980s, right, was that ideas have consequences. But for those ideas to have consequences, you need to build institutions and networks that will support and promote them and connect them to power. And so there was this idea that the federal society would would become something bigger even from the beginning. Um, and then when it started spreading into different law schools, uh, the founders then were brought into the Reagan Justice Department. They were credentialed by Ed Meese, then attorney general. They were given sanction and credentials by Ronald Reagan himself. And funders took notice. Republican elites took notice. And they start investing heavily in this organization, then that builds out from the law schools into practicing lawyers groups, into sort of more professional training. And then by the 1990s, within the first decade, that's when you see Leonard Leo join. And Leonard Leo is a Washington insider with connections to the Republican Party, and more importantly, connections to money. So Leo, as I say, there was ideas have consequences, but the other prominent saying in the early 80s was policy is people. And that's something that these early Fed socks would say over and over and over again. So, you know, I would say ideas have consequences was sort of the humble origin story of this, you know, small student group that wanted to bring conservative ideas into the law schools. But policy as people was the Leonard Leo side, was the side that acknowledges that ideas only have consequences when you connect them to powerful people, to money, to resources, to networks and institutions. I mean, that's what's so interesting about what's happened is that we've got these people who've been placed at the sort of highest echelons of power, and suddenly the people are not good enough, right? Like they don't seem to be satisfying whatever it is that Donald Trump wants to scratch. I think probably for most listeners, Amanda, the Fed sock kind of hegemonic control over conservative legal power and thinking becomes plain when Donald Trump takes the White House and, as you said, contracts out almost entirely, uh, you know, to a couple of groups. Pick our judges. You just pick them and put your imprimatur on them. But I wonder what degree of, you know, the big legal ideas separate and apart from the people that the Trump administration was pushing in 2016, 2017, the Muslim ban, building a wall, family separation, tearing down the wall between church and state, deregulation. How much of that idea hatching came from FedSoc? How much of it came from other entities that I don't know about? That's a great question. And I think certainly when we talk about the deregulatory agenda, that's something that has been brewing in federal society since the beginning, right? This is one of the motivating forces behind the foundation of the federal society was that the administrative state was unwieldy, that, you know, we had become the nanny state and that we needed to sort of liberate people and corporations and markets. So certainly that deregulatory agenda, you know, has been something that's been front and center for the federal society for 40 years. You know, some of these other legal areas like deportation, uh, family separation, you know, they come from from Trump's legal advisors, um, more so than the federal society. But then the job of the federal society is then to say, like, any good White House lawyer, a member of the Office of Legal Counsel, here's what I want to do, make it legal. All right, so I think that's the interesting question here is the extent to which those 
good FedSoc lawyers in the Office of the Legal Counsel who were elite lawyers, um, who sort of came up and were raised by the Federal Society, were then trying to fit these Trumpian ideas that seem by and large unlawful into some kind of legal framework. And, you know, my current research project actually looks at the Office of Legal Counsel over time and thinking about the ways Democratic and Republican lawyers faced with this tension, right? Here's the law, but here's what the president wants. And the president appointed me, and I want to be sort of a good servant, then creatively manipulate the law to fit what that president wants. And I think that's really the long-term consequences of what we'll see from the Trump administration, not just the decisions the judges made, but these sort of executive branch lawyers. You know, we call this in political science autocratic legalism, right? The way in which you use lawyers to actually enshrine lawfully autocracy, right? Um, sort of non-lawful measures become lawful and ingrained in law. That That's going to have, I think, longer-term consequences. So that that leads me so deliciously to the question that I really have specifically for you, which is, is there one moment that you have clocked in your research or just analysis at which Donald Trump just sours on FedSoc? Because, as you said, there's a lot of whispering, right? Don McGahn, like, secretly is writing memos to the file saying, like, well, I'm not going to do that. But it seems, at least from the New York Times reporting, that when Donald Trump really decided he hated his White House lawyers, he hated the Justice Department legal officials, was when he wanted to overturn the 2020 election and they told him no. Is is that the moment? Is that the moment at which he just starts pulling from, you know, the the Claremont folks and the Heritage folks and wherever he could find people that were willing to say, oh, yeah, no, this is perfectly legal because, you know, why not? Is that the moment at which he just breaks ties with FedSoc and says, you're not green lighting what I want enough? It seems to me that 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 is such a high stakes moment for Trump. It's the moment at which he's going to hang on to power or he's not. And that's also a high stakes moment for these FedSocs who are sort of watching this happen. and then listening to what the president wants. And even someone as conservative as Mike Pence has reservations about pursuing what would be a radical plan to keep Donald Trump in, in office and to overturn the 2020 election. Now, at the same time, they're rowing in the same direction. FedSoc elites, Leonard Leo starts the Honest Elections Project. He's just trying to do it in a way that looks more legitimate. Right. So there is a, an effort state by state to try to question right, the election results. And the Fed Sox are deeply invested and involved in that, but they're not involved in it in the way that John Eastman is. And you mentioned the Claremont Institute. Um, so, so, Dolly, I think you're right. I think that is the highest stakes moment for Donald Trump. And if he and when he doesn't get the answers he wants in the manner he wants them. From folks like Leonard Leo and the other FedSoc elites who are doing that work, they're just doing it in a different way to try to overturn the 2020 election. Then he goes and seeks out folks who are, as you said, far more fringy and radical in their thinking to the point where they're actually considered to being disbarred because they're what they're proposing is actually so unlawful. Yeah, it's funny. It almost feels as as though what you're saying, Amanda, is that Leonard Leo is like, no, the gentleman's way to do this is just suppress the vote. Precisely. (laughs) That's how we do it within the (laughs) confines of the law, whereas John Eastman is like, oh, I've got a better idea. Let's just like throw out the election results. And that just seems unseemly. There's a whisper here that is really different from, no, we're just going to get Jeffrey Clark to become the attorney general. And so it, it it's about optics and feelings and like a very visceral sense of where the line is that is coming from inside FedSoc. Yeah, this is the gentleman's way. And the gentleman's way preserves the very institutions that these folks are deeply invested in preserving. Whereas the non-gentleman's way, the John Eastman way, 
almost burns down those institutions. And so I think, again, we're back to this, they're rowing in the same direction, but, you know, the the gentleman's rowboat's not going fast enough for the speedboat that is Donald Trump and John Eastman and Rudy Giuliani, who who don't care, you know, the what kind of wake they're causing um, when they're doing this. We're going to pause now to hear from one of our great sponsors on the show, our friends at Up First on NPR. So breaking news can be challenging to consume nowadays. And if you're constantly doom scrolling on social media, it can really take a toll. If this sounds like you, check out Up First on NPR. Up First frees you from the all-day scroll obsession by telling you everything you need to know in an easy 15 minutes. No BS, just the facts. Up First is the cure you need for the news fatigue. Up First provides the top three news stories to start your day with digestible 10 to 15 minute episodes. It is all the news you need so you can get back to your life and feel informed without losing your mind in the process. With the elections in 2024, pending indictments, AI and more, we know it's going to be chaos. The show provides a concise description of the top news headlines of the day, bringing listeners up to speed quickly on what's happening in the world. Let Up First guide you through the news cycle so you can save your energy for the kids, errands, or the new season of your favorite reality show. Stay informed every morning with Up First. Listen now to Up First from NPR, wherever you get your podcasts. Today, one in three women are blocked from getting abortion care in their home state. Over the past year, lawmakers in 22 states and counting have stripped reproductive freedom from nearly 21 million women, plus more trans and non-binary people. Across the country, politicians are pushing to control bodies, lives, and futures. There is no end in sight. They want a nationwide ban on abortion, and they're also attacking birth control, sex education, care for trans people, and more of our human rights. Planned Parenthood is fighting to make sure everyone can get the care that they need. They'll never back down. They'll never stop fighting because everyone deserves sexual and reproductive health care, no matter what. You can join the movement and donate today. Visit PlannedParenthood.org future. So, Amanda, this is where I just want to ask you, these names, uh, particularly in the New York Times piece from November 1st, talk about someone called Russell T. Vogt, a former senior Trump administration official who runs a think tank. This is the guy who says, quote, the Federalist Society doesn't know what time it is. Uh, They're talking about Stephen Miller, not a lawyer. John Mm -hmm. McEntee, not a lawyer. Also, uh, Mark Pauletta, uh, Mike Davis, uh, you know, a bunch of people who are, as I said, some of them not attorneys at all. Some of them, I guess, FedSoc people who are disenchanted with FedSoc. Where if there's little hatchlings, where are they coming from? One important thing for for us to be clear about is, you know, the Federal Society is almost synonymous with conservative lawyers now. So it, it, it starts off where there's kind of a smaller, more identifiable group of elites. But as it becomes powerful, it attracts anyone who's right of center who wants any kind of shot at being a political appointee, a law clerk, a judge, or a justice. And so it becomes the gatekeeper organization. And yet, there are folks who operate very much at the margins of the federal society. And, you know, one thing that I talk about in my second book, Separate But Faithful, is that the real fringy kind of Christian right folks were kept out of the mainstream at the beginning of the federal society. The Fed Sox wanted to be taken seriously by their liberal elite law school colleagues. And so the idea that you would say, you know, God's law over man's law, and we need to get back to a Christian worldview understanding of the law, that was really kept out of the mainstream. And what Donald Trump has done is make that acceptable by courting evangelicals, by going to Liberty Law School, Jerry Falwell's law school. Right. By sort of building relationships with that Christian worldview, more fringy, more radical set of conservative lawyers. 
and then bringing them in in ways that were it just up to FedSoc, we wouldn't be bringing these folks into the mainstream, right? Because they're not actually taken very seriously, <laughs> even by FedSoc. And so as you say, you know, where are these folks popping up from? I'm not saying they're going to these Christian worldview law schools, but there are sort of conservative lawyers who exist at the mainstream and fringes of the federal society who join because they know that is synonymous with career advancement for conservative lawyers, but who aren't going to play by Leonard Leo's gentleman rules. And I think those are the folks that are really um, causing causing trouble uh, for Leonard Leo right now. So I think you just anticipated my next question, which is, I always felt that FedSoc managed to bridge or elide or paper over, you know, originalism on the one hand, the sort of deregulatory efforts of the Koch brothers on the other, and then some of the religious zealotry that you've just suggested animates everything but gets tamped down. But then it feels like there's other philosophies that are entering the bloodstream here. The New York Times piece suggests now we're looking at America first, right? We're looking at anti-immigration. That's the the privilege theory. Uh, Politico recently reported on this movement called the Convention of the States that wants to remake the entire Constitution, a theory that uh, I guess is endorsed by Speaker of the House Mike Johnson. So it does feel as though there was a way that Leonard Leo and FedSoc managed to hold all the sort of disparate pieces together. And suddenly there's a really, really overwhelming sort of anti-immigration wing that we didn't see before, a really overwhelming religious wing separate and apart from the old religious wing. It just seems Seems like the tent cannot contain some of these very, very strong conservative legal ideas, some of which are not even really legal ideas in the first instance. I think that's a that's right on, Dahlia. And I think, you know, just for some context, Mike Johnson is of this Christian worldview world. He was to be the dean at Judge John Paul Pressler Law School in, in Louisiana, which was founded because They thought Jerry Falwell's Liberty Law School was not conservative enough, all right? They end up sort of folding before they open. But he is, again, one of these folks who rides Trump's coattails to power from the very fringes and margins of, you know, the conservative movement right into the center of power. And I think so much of what Donald Trump wants cannot be accomplished through the law, which is why, as you note, so many of these folks advising him are not lawyers. And so the question is going to be, how far can we push or stretch the law before it's just lawless and it's acknowledged by everyone as lawless? And then secondly, will FedSoc, will Leonard Leo, will these conservative elites who have spent four decades investing in legal institutions who are deeply invested in the idea that the public needs to see these courts as legitimate because they're the only source of power, right, for conservatives whose beliefs will not win at the ballot box, right? They will not win at the ballot box, so you have to capture the courts and you have to enforce them through minority institutions. So they're deeply invested in the fact that these institutions need to be seen as legitimate, as respectable. And Trump and his team right now are working very hard uh, to dismantle that. And I think that is going to be the real battle. Um, and, and does the left sort of enlist Leonard Leo and conservative lawyers in service of preserving the courts? Or does the left point out, hey, these courts have been illegitimate for a long time. They've just been doing it in, in this more kind of gentlemanly acceptable way, as you as you said, by disenfranchising voters, not by overtly trying to overturn the 2020 election. Colorblind constitutionalism, not outright racism and American first white supremacy. And so, again, I think this is going to be the interesting tension moving forward. I, I want to ask you a question to which I have no idea how you could possibly parse the answer, but I'm really curious about who's using who. And and by that, I simply mean there was a, a funny line 
I think in the New York Times piece where Leonard Leo, one of the reason he starts to to cool on Donald Trump is he doesn't like that it looks transactional is his word, you know, that Donald Trump is just using FedSoc for his purely kind of self-interested goals because Leonard Leo like has this like very lofty idea of what he's doing. But at the same time, Leonard Leo is, of course, perfectly transactional with Donald Trump, right? Holds his nose with someone who does not care about the law of the Constitution, but he's about to get all these uh, judges seated. Do you have any sense, and maybe it's your fire thing, everybody thinks they're controlling the other guy's fire. Do you have any sense at this point who's using who to their own ends? You know, you talk about Leonard Leo being horrified that it looks transactional, right? Um, it's just, it can be transactional, but it can't look transactional. Those appearances are very important to maintaining sort of the integrity right, of the law and the legal system. From my perspective, Donald Trump is all id. Right. He's not playing three dimensional chess with anyone. He is just going by his emotions, by his gut. He sort of reacts and erupts violently in one direction or the other. And I think Leonard Leo and folks thought that they could sort of maneuver Trump in particular ways. And now that that Trump is out of power and looking to gain power again, he's going to try to do it on his own terms. I also think that Trump is probably not going to, if he does sideline Leonard Leo, then that's a move that will cost him any of those voters in 2016 who, again, like Leo, held their nose and voted for Trump because of the Supreme Court. If Trump no longer will commit to appointing these, again, Fed sock judges and justices who we know can be controlled, and we know how they're going to rule, then maybe mainstream Republican voters won't show up for Donald Trump in 2024 in the way they did in 2016. Do I think that Trump is thinking through that calculus in a sophisticated way? No. Like I said, he is all id, right? He's just out there. (laughs) Trump's going to Trump. But I do think Leonard Leo is thinking through his next move right now. And I actually think Leonard Leo benefits from that story in the New York Times. Because it makes Leonard Leo and the Federal Society look like, quote, normies, right? That they're mainstream and it's Trump and these other folks who are very fringy and radical. And so when we think about kind of in political science, we talk about the Overton window, like the window of what is normal and acceptable. And you can move that by exposing people to something that is so fringy and so radical that what you're proposing looks pale in comparison. And so I think actually Leonard Leo benefited greatly from that story in the New York Times and that there's a certain amount of brand control that's being done right now by the Federal Society to carefully distance themselves from Trump. And so I think that is is what we're going to see moving forward. So your business was humming, and now suddenly you're falling behind. You're finding yourself with your teams buried in manual work. It's suddenly taking forever to close the books. If this is you, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000, that is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash amicus. That's netsuite.com slash amicus to get your own KPI checklist. NetSuite dot com slash amicus. If I would have kept making only the minimum payments on my credit cards, my debt would have taken me 47 years to pay off. These are real national debt relief customers. 
I knew I wasn't going to be able to get out of debt by myself. Credit card, medical, or personal loan debt? National Debt Relief negotiates with your creditors to reduce what you owe. National Debt Relief got me out of debt. You could be debt-free in as little as 24 to 48 months. Visit nationaldebtrelief.com to learn more and get started. nationaldebtrelief.com Amanda, you just led me right to where I want to be right now, which is the normie FedSoc justices, right? Suddenly we live in a world in which Brett <laughs> Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, right, the darlings of FedSoc, are the center of the U.S. Supreme Court. And not only the center of the Supreme Court, but I would submit, I think this is right, really pumping the brakes on even their own ideas from two terms ago. They are the ones who seem to be saying, Oh, we're a lot of things, but we're not crazy MAGA justices. And you see Mm -hmm. that not just in terms of the doctrine last term where they were both, I think, with Chief Justice John Roberts saying, whatever else we are, we're not nuts. But even I think, you know, the, the breaking news we talked about at the top of the show, which is kind of insisting that we have ethics rules, like that's coming from Kavanaugh and Barrett and the Chief Justice. That is not coming from the far right wing of the court. And I find myself really wondering if this, quote unquote, moderate center of the U.S. Supreme Court <laughs> is a kind of emblematic of the FedSoc problem you're describing, which is these were seen as radical, wildly out of touch justices not two years ago, and suddenly they're Justice Kennedy and Justice O'Connor. That's that's right. Yeah. No, I think you've described it perfectly. Um, and again, you know, one of the things I talk about in both Ideas with Consequences and Separate but Faithful is that, you know, the work to normalize ideas and to legitimate ideas doesn't just happen on the Supreme Court. That's work that happens outside of the court. And one of the roles that the Federal Society has played over time is that through, you know, legal scholarship and through appearing at public events, um, they have kind of normalized and legitimized originalism, which, you know, 40 years ago, was seen as wacky, off the wall. The idea that we would look to the Constitution and say, oh, I know, uh, when we try to figure out what, you know, the right to keep and bear arms means, let's ask, what would someone in 1791 think? Right? That, w- that was fringy, off the wall, totally radical thinking 40 years ago. And now we're in a place where, you know, not only are we originalists, but the left is embracing and adopting originalism, right? Because it's become the dominant discourse on the court. And that didn't just happen because Supreme Court justices started issuing originalist opinions. A lot of that, what I call cultural capital, was built outside the court by these networks. And so when we think about Kavanaugh and Barrett as representing the new kind of moderate centrist view on the court— That's not just a reflection of the court. It's a reflection of all of this work that's been done outside the court and how they're able to define themselves against the fringy, now radical, now lunatic MAGA lawyers. And so the New York Times article, I think, you know, calling the Federal Society lawyers squishes, right, that they're squishy, that they're normie, that they're not real America first lawyers is doing a lot of this work, again, on behalf of the court and on behalf of the Federal Society and making their ideas seem very, very mainstream. I, it, it, it's like you're getting clocked on the head with the Overton window. It's happening so fast <laughs> that you're like, oh, right, yeah. Leonard Leo is a squish. I, I feel like I do have to ask you because FedSoc just had its annual conference and um, I confess I did not attend. Uh, was there any vibe that you want to share in terms of how did the conference map on to, you know, that same New York Times story that says ah, FedSoc's over. Uh, Stephen Miller is now, <laughs> you know, going to be the, the brain trust of the conservative legal movement. Was there a sense that, I mean, I know the numbers are astonishing and the, you know, conference was well attended and they're off the charts by every measure. Is there a sense inside the House that FedSoc is over? I don't think there is. Um, and particularly when Amy Coney Barrett is the keynote and 
coming off the sort of victorious overturning of Roe versus Wade and being subject to, you know, standing ovations, the Federal Society still claims all six justices of the Supreme Court. Now, Roberts has not been an active participant in Federal Society meetings since he was appointed to the court, but the other five have, right? And so they still have at least five justices on the Supreme Court. That is incredible, right? That a single organization can be responsible for a majority, five of the nine justices on the Supreme Court. So I think there is a lot to celebrate within the Federal Society. And I think one of the interesting things at the top of the hour, you mentioned the the new ethics rules. And there are ways in reading those very vague, ambiguous rules that might preclude these justices continuing to be deeply involved with the Federal Society. And I think lacking an enforcement mechanism, the only way that we're going to see that ethics code take shape is if the public enforces it, right? As if the public rises up and says, really, these justices appearing before this organization funded by these folks, parties to these cases, pushing these theories, seems to me to violate this provision of the ethics code, Um So I don't think there's any sense within the federal society itself that they're over. I think this is a particularly Donald Trump problem, not a Republican Party problem. And as long as the federal society stays very tight and cozy with the Republican Party, then whenever there's a Republican president, they're going to have an impact. And I think they know that. And can you just, as a follow-up to that, it does feel a little bit as though Leonard Leo himself has moved on from FedSoc. You know, he's got all these global, cultural, religious, you know, shape-shifting, vote suppression, uh, side hustles going. I mean, is he done with FedSoc? So I think to some extent, Leo did what he wanted to do with the courts. He's got the Supreme Court. He's got young conservative FedSoc justices on the courts of appeals and the district courts. And while Republicans are out of power, he can pursue these side projects like trying to remake the entire culture (laughs) in the guise of, you know, Leonard Leo. Um, And so I, I think these other projects are a reflection of the fact that he views that he has been so successful with the Federal Society. Uh, It's not that he's done with the Federal Society, but as Republicans are out of power with the presidency, that he's looking for ways to apply that same FedSoc model to other areas where conservatives feel like they're losing, right? So the culture is a big one, the culture wars, trying to bring kind of conservative and libertarian views, not just to the courts, but to the mainstream culture. And that's an area where, as I mentioned earlier, I think that's a mismatch of kind of approach because the FedSoc's success is because they've been able to target a minority institution, right? Courts. You can't take that same approach with a culture that is by and large rejecting these ideas and has for a very long time, actually. (laughs) So the only hope they have is to kind of thwart the majority by hanging on to these judicial and legal institutions. And and does the fact, and we can wrap here, but it's my sort of grim wrap around to where we started, that it's entirely possible that what is legal, what the courts want, protection of institutions, is all just going to be immaterial in the hands of Jeffrey Clark and, you know, Stephen Miller and John McEntee. Like, Is that the fear that you and I are having a conversation that is in a certain bandwidth of what is tolerable within the bounds of law and lawyers and lawyering and justice and constitutionalism? And we're about to plunge into this world of just complete Calvin Ball. Uh, I think that's a legitimate fear. And I'll be honest with you, when Donald Trump was elected, those were the thoughts going through my mind in 2016, right? At Pomona College right now, I'm teaching Con Law 1, and we're doing emergency powers. So these kinds of conversations are very, very much at the forefront of my mind. What does it look like 
when a president declares an emergency, invokes the Insurrection Act, you know, gives themselves these exorbitant powers that are resistant to the ordinary processes and rules of law. And that is a very, very scary reality to imagine. I would hope that the army of lawyers that Leonard Leo built up in connection with, you know, all the lawyers in the country and people who are watching this would stand up against it. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, if Donald Trump has the military. And so um, the only thing we can do is sort of call it out and hope that good people are willing to disobey. And, and that is <laughs> that is the scariest place I can imagine us being. Right. So. Um, so my deep hope is that the lawyers and the judges and folks who care about the rule of law would push back against that. And maybe the way we push back is by making sure that Donald Trump never gets elected to president again. I, I feel like, Amanda, I just heard you say that the same FedSoc lawyers that chilled us to the bone seven years ago are the ones we have to invest some hope into now because the alternative... Save us, Obi-Wan. Yeah. It's really, <laughs> really scary, but this is exactly what I thought you were going to say, so I can't say I'm surprised. Amanda Hollis Frusky is professor of politics at Pomona College, author of the, I think, really just unbelievably important book, Ideas with Consequences, The Federalist Society and the Conservative Counter-Revolution, published by Oxford University Press in 2015. She's also co-author of Separate but Faithful, The Christian Rights Radical Struggle to Transform Law and Legal Culture, also Oxford University Press 2020. Amanda, I'm so grateful for your big brain and your work on an issue that <laughs> I think we sometimes caricature, but like you've really helped unpeel all the various strands and helped, I think, raise this question of what the stakes are for the possibility that FedSoc is by no means the scariest game in town. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dahlia, and thank you for your work. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in. Thank you so much for your letters and your questions and your emails. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com, or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Burningham and Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate, and Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We're going to take a wee little break over Thanksgiving next week, but we will be back at the beginning of December with some, I think, really exciting news. Until then, take good care.